scale, but also a small scale. So what do I mean that small scale, obviously in terms of um, material design and um, the fractional mechanism of production, but um, when I mean this large scale, is how do we even take nature in terms of interlinking things in networks, and how does an ecosystem work? And now that I'm an ecologist who studies systems thinking of nature, how does it fit or fit it together very well? That mimicry happens everywhere, um, uh, even we are not even aware of. So, what you see in this picture are glass sponges uh, in the deep sea. They imitate this famous building here in London. So, architecture is losing a lot of value um, growing. Um, let's, let's kind of look at uh, circular economy and, and marine ecology. So this would be an example for circular economy in the ocean. But you start with the cytoplankton up there. Um, so this is the cytoplankton in the ocean, which is true for the soup, but with all these tiny little crabs and larvae and um, other stuff that is eaten by small fish, who then which then is again nutrient for cytoplankton. So that would be a small and perfect. Now it gets a little bit more complicated, and this is this is what the whole economy would be like, right? Um, on my laptop, I have the function to kind of zoom in and out. I don't have it here, so I'll just try. Um, so this is what we kind of just saw. Um, it starts here with coral spawning. So these are the coral reefs. You have um, coral eggs and sperm released into the water, which is eaten by fish. Which is then feces again, food for phytoplankton, zooplankton, and pathogens that circle. So that is, that is one circle. Um, and then for those who survive, um, they become coral polyps who build coral colonies, which make them coral reefs, like this one. And then we have like a small circle here uh, that was a fish that I did my um, the first week study on, which are coral colonies. Uh, and they live inside these corals, they're dependent on them. They rescue corals from other algae that wants to overgrow them, they kind of defend them against other predators, and, and they kind of help each other out. So they live in this relationship. There are other circles, for example, like this one, where parrotfish, like this one here, eats from the coral um, and then pulls coral out. Again, you see here the sand, which is Making our beaches, and yes, our beaches are sand proof. Uh, or fish proof, so. um, And the beaches um, create islands, which in, again are um, habitat for corals. Um, so, this is another circle. And another circle would be um, that the coral reefs are kind of like a nursery for all these big fish, like here a picture of the yellow tuna, um, which are the predator, which is the prey for sharks. Um, sharks also eat um, other fish, like um, in this case it's a, a, a live fish. Um, but they eat the big, big fish that usually would eat the algae eating cleaner fish on the reef. Uh, and kind of, so it's said that sharks keep the system in check so that there are in the end enough fish that clean the reef. Because if they don't clean the reef, corals can't grow. If you get about a year, for example, let's take the sharks out of the year, the coral reefs would be dead. So that would be another circle. And there are lots more. So this is kind of what the blue economy does. It doesn't only have one circular circle, it has one. And I hope to get that across. Exactly. Now looking at the ocean, um, again, this is a big thing. Um, I just quickly want to go through them and then I can kind of go more on the solutions. But I wanted to give an overview of all the problems that we have regarding water. Um, we start here, aquaculture, obviously, that um, gives chemical pollution, destruction um, of, of sea sites, oh, sorry, um, altering gene pool, overfishing by prey. So obviously that is something that escapes from aquacultures um, and that we are the chief for sort of fishing of prey. So even if we have an aquaculture and we say um, great we save um, 
um, catching fish, then we catch the fish that ends up being prey for those in the aquaculture. That's another problem. So overfishing in general, the amount of catch which is really, really unsustainable, the amount of bycatch that we have is about a third um, of all the fish that we eat. It just gets thrown overboard again and keeps on trawling um, with another big problem in the oceans. Um, then something that has uh, happened in the oceans but also already in the city, a uh, lot more pollution, wastewater, obviously, and unsustainable usage of water. Um, so pollution could be anything from sewage to um, stuff that um, that's drained from agriculture, um, farmland, plastic pollution, heavy metals, toxins, oils, obviously. Later on, again, sewage, um, which includes kind of anything from black water to grey water, um, and unsustainable usage, construction, households. Um, privatization of water is a big one also, which um, kind of leads to water not being broadly accessible for everyone, not being affordable, um, and also low investment to maintain the structures. Um, and then climate change, so higher temperatures in the water cause um, because warmer water, water and lower density of the water, which makes all the methane that is stored in our oceans coming up, increasing climate change. Acidification, again, um, ocean is, the oceans are a big CO2 sink. I don't know if you've heard that before. The sink is full, so capacity is almost reached. That's why the age levels start changing in water, which leads to decreasing concentration rates. Um, we also have invasive species and sound pollution just on the sides, and kind of like it all is connected with inhibiting the self healing. Water. And now, go through what I mean by that. Um, so, yeah, just a couple of examples on aquaculture and overfishing and also some pollution that the blue economy or, or the circular economy will have to offer. So, I discovered um, some um, uh, started to grow up from the urban farms and I have already doing stuff like that. From, uh, growing vegetables with the aquaculture they have. So you see over, over there, um, nutrient rich water from the fish kind of, kind of goes to the vegetables and they grow the vegetables. So the water comes back and this is kind of a circle and they can sell vegetables. Another idea um, and that's more of the economy here already um, is bringing worms from um, food bags, from organic food bags. And feeding fish that would that are more meat eaters, like um, hogs or salmon, for example. And then again, you can plant your vegetables. This is, by the way, the first hydroponic um, fish tank. The blue economy will have a lot of errors kind of going out because there are, there are multiple income streams, basically. So there are multiple things that we can do with all of this. It's not only like one sort of thing first. Um, a solution to overfishing are um, hybrid models uh, such as this one, or, or kind of um, going back to um, sailing ships again, um, which also sort out the sound pollution in water. By the way, that's not good anyway. Um, so, apparently, um, there are a couple of, of French vessels that were bought by the Moroccan government already um, that. Increase the fish catch by the factor of 2.5. I think um, Anne MacArthur published something by increasing the, the, the yield of fish catch if we would, if we would kind of have it sustainable by um, 40, 40 million or something. I can't remember exactly the number, but um, definitely it's, it's um, more than five times more than we have for in the island. Um, start sustainable fishing. So the, the theory is that the oceans could sustain us with all the fish that we need, but the only problem is the methodology that kind of keeps us from doing that. But that would kind of lead to one. Um, like a sailing ship. Yeah, so another big topic is pollution, waste of water and unsustainable usage that we can see here. Um, there are lots of different numbers in 
the amount of waste that we produce um, from 30 to 170 million tons plastic waste annually. A very small percentage, less than 10%, gets recycled at the moment. That's a picture of an island that I work very closely by called Tila Fushi, which is the rubbish island in Monty, which is the most uh, popular BBC and all of that. So, um, the, is, the rubbish is directly washed into the water here. That's from the circular economy book where um, what happens with the, the plastic packaging there. So this number is a lot higher. It's almost three times, three times more than the other um, And most of it still ends up in the landfill, like you just said, a really small percentage is um, recycled. Um, whereas we still have kind of losses or, or in, in, in that even um, leakage and um, quite a big amount also is incinerated. Um, whereas the, in the EDA, EDA were the circular economy, um, we would recycle a lot more, kind of reuse and recycle as the first step, and then drastically reduce uh, the leakage of plastic into natural systems and then the kind of decrease plastics from fossil our feedstocks. Um, now I think the circle of the blue economy isn't quite at the hand of that, but I just wanted to give some examples first of all of stuff that kind of is already reusing things or kind of thinking things differently. Uh, like this um, uh, this graph here, they're collecting rubbish from beaches and kind of recycling it into bottles and are reused. Um, then we have eatable spoons here. Um, the company will come um, to something called plastic curbstone, which is CO2 kind of compact into this material. It's quite strong and firm and used as construction material. Um, just that's all plastic. And this is a Mycelium chair, so it's a uh, 3D printed cornstarch into certain shapes that are then overgrown or outgrown in a certain kind of fungus. Uh, and, and then hardened, and then becomes much more powerful and stronger than plastic. And there are lots of innovative ideas with um, introducing certain enzymes uh, in plants and in health making. Um, PhD like plastic um, things that are uh, in that. Um, I met the guy who created the spoon last year. Amazing. And um, he bought me a cup of tea to try out the, the teaspoon. Yeah. Um, and he gave me a whole bunch of different ones. And it's a really fascinating story of, of real entrepreneurs spending hours and hours, year upon year, making sure that each one has the correct structure to be used. It's not just one thing in the structure to exclude. Each one has different flavour, each one has different sustainability aspects to it. So soup spoons would be very different to it. And it seems to really use a fascinating way. What What's the most tasty spoon? Uh, the tea the teaspoon for me was the best because the soup spoon had to be uh, much blander. Um, because you have the different types of soup that you would use, but it has to be much stronger. So the millet has to be a higher grade uh, and, and stronger spoon. It's just, it's just it's, we spent probably an hour together just talking about these different spoons. It's really, really nice. Okay. But it was it was nice and done with sort of how you engage and how you in terms of perception how you perceive something. Right. 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 Um that's an interesting new comedy that kind of creates a common true ways. So uh probably is that Aerobic material processes. And coming to 
water pollution. So looking at what, what actually are the percentages, what do we use water for? Washing, um, showering, obviously, um, it's quite a big percentage in terms of toilet flushing. I think in the UK only we have um, 45 million toilets that flush about 2 billion liters of water. And, um, and then lots of diverse things like outdoor uh, the blue economy has a couple of really interesting things to um, to offer here. One is the separation toilet. Um, so what you can see here is that the urine kind of gets separated from the hard particles. And what happens with the hard particles is that so there's a kind of um, chamber that um, through Hot air coming up kind of sucks the, the, the hard particles very quickly inside. It's just gravity, there's no energy needed. Um, and then the, the stuff is dried really, really quickly. So there's almost no smell. Um, it's also um, much better in terms of so, um, polluting water. Um, so it helps um, against spreading diseases because it's dried very, very quickly. Um, and the smell comes, comes from usually bringing urine and feces together. But our body has worked on, okay, thank you, um, for a very long time separating these things. So that's what we're trying to do biomimicry, kind of imitate, imitate human being. Another thing is rainwater. Um, you see here a map of England, it rains quite a lot. And um, so within about one and a half, um, years usually you could have the costs in, inside that um, could be involved in rainwater tanks. Um, and here, comparison of London and Mexico City, so it rains constantly quite a lot. Um, <laughs> so that's quite interesting just to compare that. Um, yeah. um, so, what did I mean with inhibited self healing? Um, the blue economy, for example, um, and maybe some examples of rivers, and, found, and then there are a couple of scientists who found out that the, the meandering of the rivers actually is an act of, of self healing of the river because of the turbulences that are integrated. The bacteria um, kind of start cleaning the water and the algae and get involved in the cleaning processes. So now it's being stricken and everything, the water can't self clean or self heal. Another thing are these beautiful. Little creatures. I um, remember when I talked about the ocean acidification and the decrease of um, calcification um, that kind of affects those little um, plants. I'm talking about plankton, so those are little um, plates that are producing a lot of oxygen. About 50 to 70 percent of the air that we breathe right now are produced by those plants. Um, and what interferes with and the, the amount of phytoplankton in the ocean are, for example, fishing whales. Yes, you have heard right. So everything is really strong in the ocean. Um, and for example, whale feces and urea uh, has an effect of the amount of phytoplankton, um, which is decreasing in the ocean already. So it's kind of just an extra thing. The whales are good for the phytoplankton. Um, and I think, yeah, I only talked about the two short news. Um, let's come back to the city a bit more um, change. Um, so, alternative energy. Um, there are lots of things the blue economy suggests on, on alternative energy. One of them are um, um, quartz crystals that can convert gravity, gravi gravity of energy, into to real floating energy, for example. Um, there's there's so, the so-called free energy that the MIT even is researching on at the moment. Um, that, yeah, basically would use things like gravity, perfectly great energy from that. Um, there are other things that would help us tremendously in terms of solar energy. Uh, one is um, having different different structures like you can see here that would be self-cleaning. Um, so. Uh, and also um, kind of 
different in the way that we um, admit um, light instead of reflecting it. So that would become 70% more effective than that now. Uh, and also that would give us, in, in general, the vision is, is those materials that are really long would be used for other materials. We could skip chemical toxins from them all together. Um, so instead of like a green economy is what I'm suggesting alternative products, the blue economy always tries to look at how can we eradicate things as a whole to change the system. Another thing that maybe is going to happen, maybe not because of efficiency um, difficulties, I think, would be uh, algae and biofuel from um, again from algae. So there are huge algae farms like this one that could potentially be um, generating the fuels of the future. Uh, and then there are other circles out there, so we'll skip that one, I think. Um, yeah, kind of other circles that look into how to generate water. So again, this is a, a normal water circular system, um, and that is a, a water circular system in a greenhouse, which basically acts very similar to this one. Um, basically takes the water out of air. So that would be another idea in how we could generally sooner or later use water and clean it. Um, and kind of use them for our own purposes but also for greenhouses. It's just like condensation. Yeah. To do that is um, invasive species. So for example in China they had a problem with algae. And there was an, uh, a Chinese entrepreneur that um, found out how to make textile uh, things, textile materials out of these algae. So we kind of look at what things happening in nature, how can we use that, and how can we create something new out of that. And coming to um, something that I'm working on towards just kind of a, a vision at, at the moment. Yes, the blue bar. Uh, I'm trying to imitate um, corals there again as well. All of corals. Um, <laughs> and what they do is they they have a kind of a sharing economy as well. So every this is a one coral polyp and it's, it's in a skeleton and it kind of shares. It's connected with every other coral, other little bit of skin as you can see here. And they kind of share um, their food. If one coral gets something to eat and the other one doesn't, so to make sure that the whole colony is so while well, and time is around. And I think um, building our economy and our ways of living and working together would be kind of based on or that's the, the base of the group here. So it would be again biodiversity, where we kind of talked about how we could merge all this, how how could we apply the blue economy on our learning and our exploring. Um, and and of a creative platform where people could work, work together and live together according to the principles of the blue economy um, and kind of start all these businesses that I've been talking about that are available as open source or have their own relative ideas. This is the last slide. <laughs> but, um, um, yeah, we share that as open source and have all of these like teaching. Um, sorry, a line. This is, I think, um, yeah, just an invitation that I wanted to add to a workshop that I'm hosting on the 2nd of July, um, which is kind of giving more, more details of the blue economy. Uh, because a friend of mine, Alexander Prinsen, who traveled the world kind of looking at all these uh, companies that are already applying the principles of the blue economy, he kind of gives an insight about. I might have should. I should always. Yeah. 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 Um, that the blue economy is not only focusing on aquaculture or agriculture or any of those, it's very broad. Same as permaculture. 
Right. For me, permaculture was something that has to do with how do I create um, a, a holistic way of gardening and kind of planting. That's my understanding of permaculture. Correct me if I'm wrong. It's it's more land based. It's uh, it comes from understanding and observing patterns in nature, Bad which is what you have just described yeah. there. But they can be yeah. applied to any right. any human settlement, okay. including food. It could be the economy. It could be. I think it's, it's an interesting distinction. Is I think that most of the projects that call themselves permaculture are more agriculture, mm. but more I think the, the reasoning yes. behind it is mm. you know, very similar. So I think that to, to broaden people's view, the right. blue economy probably is a slightly better word to use now, a better phrase to use now, because people are so focused on permaculture being land-based. Mm -hmm. Also, the all the permaculture courses I've seen in Bali and India yeah. seem to be always about gardening. Yeah. So in Austria, there is a strong permaculture. I think it's only one of the inventors of permaculture. A lot about how to apply things around the house, but it's all related to planting. It's very new to me. See what is the future, the auction future in London. Yeah. <laughs>